Great. So it is the top of the hour, uh, depending on your time zone, two o'clock in the central and one in mountain. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Thank you all for joining us for today's Building Resilience, Maintaining Quality Care in Nursing Homes During COVID and Beyond. Um, I'm Catherine Carrico. I'm with the University of Wyoming Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Uh, and part of this collaborative group that is bringing you today's uh, ECHO. Today, our topic is going to be individual resiliency uh, on April 26, 2023. Next slide. So this uh, ECHO is brought to you by the Great Plains Mountain GWEP Consortium. That is a consortium of geriatrics workforce enhancement programs in uh, North Dakota, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming. Right, so the opportunities around this echo include hopefully you had a chance to watch the uh, microburst video uh, by Dr. McLean. It was a really wonderful overview of uh, resiliency, uh, including information on stress and burnout, and we'll review that in just a moment. Also, uh, so we invite you to watch those videos before each of our four monthly sessions. In addition, this is really an opportunity for you to gather experiences, stories, questions, um, problems that you're trying to solve with your staff. So with your CNAs, nurses, and other providers in the homes that you um, work in or perhaps administer. And then we'll also encourage you to use these sessions to identify opportunities for QAPI projects. We will be, uh, we'll have a, information on QAPI during each session, and we invite you to really engage in QAPI in the, between our monthly sessions as well. Next slide. So our agenda for today, we're going to start, we'll briefly summarize the microburst video to either remind you or give you a little um, insight into what that video had if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, then we'll go into our case discussion, then some uh, focus time on QAPI, specifically individual re resiliency is related to QAPI. And then um, we'll have 30 minutes after that. So there's a kind of structured time for our session is 30 minutes. And then we have 30 minutes of discussion time that we'll start after that. We uh, invite you to, to join us for those 30 minutes afterwards for more discussion. All right, so right now we're going to have a few poll questions that will pop up. We'll give you a few moments to answer those polls. Rebecca, oh, thank you. I see it now. There they are. So all three questions are in one poll. Give you a moment to respond. Great, next slide. So just to recap, um, Dr. Andrew McLean uh, presented a microburst video on individual resiliency. During that video, he helped to distinguish between stress, uh, some of the individual factors that provide sources of stress to all of us, and burnout, um, or some of the more clinically focused syndromes that can occur as a result of chronic workplace stress, uh, particularly when that chronic workplace stress isn't uh, managed uh, skillfully and, and managed for the long term. So what can happen when someone moves into burnout includes uh, feelings and expression of cynicism, exhaustion, and ultimately becoming inefficient uh, in, in their work. The tools that Dr. McLean discussed include uh, creating and fostering resilient attitudes within a person. So working on um, considering change and challenge as opportunities to think about um, your struggles in relation to the, the larger world and to also have that kind of uh, rational or realistic view of the things that you're up against, as well as setting goals and creating action steps to um, implement healthy behaviors that will help to sustain you. 
Um, those behaviors included uh, what he called the three R's, which were really great, uh, rest, routine, and relationships, um, with a particular emphasis on relationships, connectedness, and um, really pushing against the, the pull to isolate that can happen when we are under stress or getting into, um, more importantly, feeling burnt out with our work. Some individual traits, uh, Dr. McLean did a great job of leading into what we'll talk about more um, during our next session next month, but also to give us some information on traits of resilient communities uh, and organizations, which really uh, takes strong leadership, uh, including the engagement of the members of those communities in order to have that shared meaning in their work, to feel that there is uh, drive and purpose, uh, even during the most challenging of times. He used the examples of um, disaster response and how to maintain uh, resilient attitudes and, and structures during those times, using resources wisely, and then paying attention to psychosocial issues within the team um, and that are occurring for staff. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Owens. She is going to lead us in our case study. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you all for taking the time to join us today on this really important topic. Um, for our case study, if you could do the next slide, please, um, we will check back in with Allison. Um, many of you were with us on our last session. We introduced Allison, who's a 23-year-old CNA who's been at Bridgewater Terrace for two years. She works evening shift and she is in nursing school. Next slide, please. So what we're going to talk about today is what's happening with Allison today. And then that will lead us into some discussion points that we will be encouraging you to be participating in. Uh, on next steps that Allison can take. So here's what's happening with Allison since we last joined her. She's just coming back to school today. She took a few days off to complete her midterm exams and her assignments. Now she's returned and her supervisor pulls her aside and asks her to be a CNA mentor for a new CNA who just joined the team on evening shift. She's, um, Allison is excited about that because her supervisor says she has selected Allison due to Allison's stellar performance. And as we talked about before, Allison is, um, she does provide great care to her residents. She is frequently requested by residents to be their CNA. Uh, she does have a routine assignment and then at times other residents uh, like to work with her because she's just so compassionate and caring. So at the same time, Allison learns that her very favorite resident has had a significant decline in her condition while she was away. This resident has decided to go onto hospice and uh, she, Allison also learns that this resident's death is imminent. So that could be a really tough piece of information to get when, when you're returning back to work. The other CNAs learned that Allison's been selected to be the mentor CNA for this new, one, new mentee. And um, several of the evening CNAs actually are a little bit disgruntled as uh, to the fact that they weren't chosen to be a mentor. That does speak a lot to the facility that they have mentors, which is awesome and that there is a desire for the staff to be able to work with team members. But some of the CNAs are feeling, like I said, a little bit disgruntled. So next slide, please. So thinking about that and what Allison is contending with, she just returned back to work. Let's take a moment to discuss what are Allison's stressors. And remember, stressors can be positive and negative. So now we'd love for you to unmute yourself and share your thoughts, or you can also put your comments into chat and we'll monitor the chat. But I'd really love for you to think about and, and tell us your thoughts about what are Allison's stressors today. Any thoughts? 
Okay, Lori, thank you. Uh, living up to her supervisor's expectations. It's always wonderful, isn't it, to be selected to do some extra additional tasks and to be acknowledged for great performance. It's also a bit unnerving uh, that, that the expectations have been raised and it does take a little bit more effort. We hear too from um, Dr. Jurevich. Whoa, I'm, I'm, here we go. Let me go back for a second. Negative stressors could be worries about her RN test performance. So she's just finished midterm exams and has that going in the background. Uh, that could be a, a challenge. So thank you. Catherine says being a mentor and then emotions about her resident. I, I totally agree there as well, Catherine. Uh, being a mentor can be fun, can't it? Um, what are some of the challenges that individuals or stressors of being a mentor? What are some of your thoughts about that? So as we look at some of these other responses, think about what stressors are associated with being a mentor. And then the other piece here is emotions regarding her resident. And um, if you'd allow me just a second to give some comment to that, uh, I personally feel like in, in our settings, uh, this is an under addressed issue. Uh, our, we want our team members to really provide compassionate care, high skilled care to residents. Uh, and that really requires that you give your all to the care of the resident. And so it's, it can be a challenge when the resident condition changes and they have made this decision and they are, um, they are choosing to move forward with comfort care. And that can be a challenge and it can be a challenge to help each other be able to deal with that. But the first step is really to acknowledge. So I'd also appreciate any comments any of you all might have about the grieving process as being at times a stressor for our team members. Um, we also have a negative stressor from Emily that the coworkers are jealous and disgruntled about her being a mentor. And that can be a challenge as well, can't it? Uh, remember, we, we heard from Dr. McLean that rest, routine, and relationships are some of the keys for managing um, stressors and having increased resilience. And it becomes a challenge when there's some tension between um, coworkers. Um, so you're right that that is an important stressor. And it's also a stressor that the supervisor needs to be aware could occur and may be able to help Allison through that. Natasha mentions that there's, a, while it's fun to be a mentor, I love being a mentor. Uh, there's also a lot more work. You have to think about your role differently and uh, be willing to answer questions and give more um, examples and explanations. Um, Renee says that the relief of having tests behind her, but also entering pre-grief over her favorite residents. So that's, once again, as we spoke about, you're absolutely right, Renee, that can be a challenge. Well, let me get um, to some of our other comments. This is wonderful. You guys are doing some great comments. Uh, I think where uh, Natasha also says, taking the time to make sure the trainee has a good experience so she stays. And that's, one of the purposes of mentor programs is to encourage uh, job satisfaction and uh, an environment that promotes learning and helps each other be able to provide excellent care. So uh, it's a good stressor. It's an important role to have that mentoring. So those are great comments. I really appreciate people taking some time. I'm just gonna quickly move through to see if we missed any other um, Rhonda says she thinks that Allison has a great handle on stress to be the caring, compassionate person that she is. That's a great comment, Rhonda. Uh, it does take a lot of emotional energy to be able to provide compassionate care. And um, it does speak a lot about a person's ability to have a, a solid level of emotional intelligence to deal with the types of stressors that we all face in post-acute and long-term care. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Brianna says, maintaining professionalism during times of high emotion. That is so well said, Brianna. That is um, 
exactly what we're all wanting to be able to do. And I, uh, I love that insight. I think then we've, we've covered most everyone's comments. We really appreciate you taking time. Dr. Jervich says advancement from CNA to LPN. <laughs> That's also one of our goals is to help people continue to move through a career ladder. And uh, it's a good stressor. And when you get tapped on the shoulder to step up and be a mentor for others, it, it's a great um, path to enhancing your career. So that's a great comment. Great, so um, if we could have the next slide, please. So now let's turn our conversation, just the next few minutes here, to um, talking about what do you think are some steps that Allison can take to manage her stress and increase her resilience. And remember, Dr. McLean talked about both stress and burnout. So, and, and one of the keys for being able to manage through these high intense occupations like it being a caregiver in post-acute long-term care or in the hospital or, or any type of clinical setting, um, one of, it's, it's always important to manage your individual stress and also stay on the alert so that it doesn't progress to a level of burnout, uh, which is, uh, uh, it's like an accumulation of stressors. So a really important way to avoid burnout is to manage personal stress. So what are some steps Allison can take? What are your thoughts? Kathy, uh, I was just going to mention too, um, I was thinking that for Allison, if she, you know, with her, one of her favorite residents um, facing difficulties, maybe right now is not the time for her to be a mentor. And so maybe speaking up to her supervisor to see if someone else who's um, maybe coping a little bit better might be able to take on that role. Natasha, that's a great point. I think it's a great take home point for uh, any clinical leader. Uh, whenever we ask someone, to take on some additional work or role. Part of our role as a clinical leader is to touch base with that person to see if it works for them at this time and how they are doing with that additional assignment and what else is needed. So that, that's an excellent point, Natasha. And it's also a point of the, uh, when Dr. McLean talked about features of a strong leadership in a community. And one of them is to be aware of that emotional component that the team members may be experiencing. So it's a great, uh, excellent point. And Dr. Jurevich says uh, administrators should provide a reward for helping with mentorship. You're absolutely correct. Make it worth people's while on several levels is, is really helpful. Sherry says, uh, she thinks in mentoring, there's some stress when an older mentoring is mentoring a new young person. It is a give and take and both learn from one another. So while it may feel like an additional step and adding to a workload, there's always a silver lining. And you bring up some great points here, Sherry, about being aware that this is a learning opportunity on both ends. Mentoring uh, goes both ways. Excellent point, thank you. Like um, Dr. Jervich uh, suggests that we that you can provide um, lunch with CNAs who want to become mentors and really make it a more formalized process. Uh, I love systems and processes and we learn a lot from those and we take, um, we can then, once we get a good system in place, we can put the energy in building it out and making it exciting and fun. So that's a great suggestion. Jennifer says uh, leadership should be asking if they're comfortable at the time to take on the mentorship challenge. And uh, once again, Jennifer, that's so important. Uh, it's uh, the easy part is uh, asking someone to do it. The, the more challenging part is, is this the right time for that person? And does that person feel supported to take on some additional tasks? as part of their role. Excellent point. So we, we want Allison to grow and to continue her career development. At the same time, we wanna make sure it's in a, uh, she gets those opportunities in a way that she can manage and doesn't 
unduly cause stress that uh, will lead to burnout. So that's excellent points. Any other comments? Oh, look, Renee is, is uh, endorsing Dr. Jurevich's uh, lunch concept and that lunch could help repair and build peer relationships at work. Renee, you're so correct on that. Um, that's another way to help the other evening CNAs uh, be able to learn how they could become a mentor. And it helps diffuse uh, that tension that may develop between peers when one person seems to be selected over others. And there may be people who are equally qualified to, to do the same role. So that's, that's excellent. And as we're seeing, some of the ways to help Alice and manage her stress actually falls on the shoulders of the leadership in the community to be sensitive to what Allison needs or, or anyone else who may be given some additional uh, uh, request to take on more work or maybe dealing with some emotional situations with their residents. Uh, the, it's really important for clinical leadership to, not, to, to go to that next level around emotional support and thinking more broadly and putting systems in place. So excellent points, absolutely excellent. Any other comments? Well, another thing, um, oh, Jennifer, thank you. I was just going to bring that up. She could uh, use the breathing exercise that we learned last month. Remember, and I know that uh, Natasha is going to be talking through that in just a moment uh, to see how the Kwabi exercise went, but we talked extensively about the role of deep breathing. It's, it's phenomenally helpful. Um, I could go on, I mean, that's, that could be a whole day of, uh, of a workshop on the value of deep breathing. Um, but really that's also a quick and easy step that Allison could take when she's feeling like I'm, when she's being asked to do some more work or to become a mentor. And she's like, okay, can I do this? But to take a deep breath. And, and use that as a way to calm down, to center, to get her thoughts together. So how is she going to approach that and have some additional conversation with the supervisor? The same thing can happen when she gets that really difficult news about her favorite resident. Just taking a moment, taking a deep breath and calming herself and gathering her thoughts on how she feels about her resident and how she's going to approach that situation during the shift. So deep breathing has lots of applications and is a tool that all of us have at our easy disposal. And the more we practice it, the better we become at it and the more effective it is for helping us manage our stress. So I'm so glad you brought that up, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, I think we've had some really good discussion. I really appreciate everyone's point of uh, points that you've placed into the chat. Here we have a summary of Dr. McLean's tools and the individual resiliency microburst. Um, Catherine, would you like to, to review those and again or? Um, well, I think we're running sh short on time. time a little okay. bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll move into the Quapi piece, but I think you can certainly see how a lot of these strategies are really salient for someone like, like Allison and her co-workers as well. Absolutely. All right. Well, now we'll welcome, um, Natasha Green and, uh, Jen Lochner to talk about our PDSA cycle and Quapi. Thank you, Catherine. So just a review of what PDSA is. Part of the flipped nursing home echoes is that when we do the learning, we understand um, how we can take some of these wonderful exercises and learnings and actually implement them and, and make them a part of our normal routine and normal day to, again, help with staffing. Because we know that staffing is a challenge. We know that it's a limitation. And so we want to make sure that the staff we do have stay and are strong and healthy. So as a reminder, PDSA stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act. So I'd like if you guys could uh, type into chat. Last time we did ask you to test out doing a breathing exercise. And again, when it comes to quality, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be something as simple as saying, I'm going to do deep breathing 
um, once, per, once per my shift when I'm feeling stressed or during my shift when I'm feeling stressed. And we wanted you to study that and take a look. How did that make me feel? Did it make an improvement for me? And if it did, we'd like to know um, if you adopted that as part of your normal routine or if you modified it. So if you could take this time as we go through next month's uh, PDSA, go ahead and if you feel comfortable coming off of mute and sharing, please do so. I know that I practiced deep breathing when I was feeling stressed at work as well. And it, I mean, you wouldn't think it would make such a difference, but it absolutely, absolutely did. Um, I was able to refocus. And if you guys could share, if you were able to implement the same PDSA, that would be great. You can just type that into chat. Next slide, please. So for this month, after taking a look at Dr. McLean's uh, presentation, talking about individual resiliency, one of the topics that came to mind that could be something that's um, easier for everybody to do is to attempt to do what we like to call huddles. And so what we're asking you all to do is to take a team huddle. It doesn't have to be long. A few minutes is all that you need and practice some emotional intelligence concepts by sharing how you're feeling or doing that day. And so um, the goal would that be that you go ahead and do that before you start patient care. So you've received your report from the other um, CNAs or nurses from the previous shift. You take just a few minutes just to touch base and give an example like you know, I had, in Allison's case, I had a really difficult, challenging class. I had a couple of days off and I was caught up, but I've got a new assignment that I just got dumped on me and it's really stressing me out. So if I miss something, I've got this new um, trainee that I'm taking on, please just let me know if I'm missing something or if I'm not working as quickly, or we may need fewer residents to care for since I am training somebody new. Just something to be transparent and try to avoid um, saying, okay or good, because that's where we all go to. We all like to just say, well, I'm doing fine. Um, but if you could practice that, take a look and see how it helps you and your team that you work with, and then report back on it. Next slide, please. So we'll have you run it, get feedback on what the team says, and then how um, if they feel like it helped them work better with the life stressors that they were dealing with, because you all had a better understanding of how your team was feeling during the start of the shift. Next slide, please. Um, next month, when we get back to our flipped echo session on team resiliency, we do want you to report out just like you are uh, reporting out in the uh, chat box right now. So um, we'll study it and see if it worked for you. And next slide, please. And then we'll decide if it's something that you should adopt as part of your normal routine. And just a reminder, we will be pasting into chat a link that is to a Google Docs, which has this PDSA. You guys don't have to write anything down. You don't have to come up with your own quality improvement project. We have it all ready for you. And so we'll paste that into chat so you have access to those materials in today's presentation as well. Okay, Catherine, I'll hand it back over to you. All right. Next slide. Thank you so much, Natasha. We have a couple more polls for post-session evaluation that are going to pop up. We'll give you a moment to complete those. You should see them now. There's two questions in that poll. We appreciate your feedback. It really helps us as we plan these sessions. Great. Next slide. And what we will um, look at for next steps includes staying on. Join us for the next 30 minutes as we continue um, a discussion around uh, stress and burnout and resiliency strategies. Uh, also, if you didn't catch that microburst video, there's a QR code on the screen. You can also find it on the website where you would have registered to go back and watch that video. And then we would encourage you to, to identify and start doing one resiliency intervention. Uh, perhaps group huddles would make a good one to uh, incorporate and to do a PDSA cycle around. And then before our next session on May 24th, uh, we ask you to watch that microburst video uh, beforehand. It will be out in the next week or so, and then join us on May 24th as we will dive into to the uh, area of team resiliency. And we invite you to set yourself a goal, invite one colleague to join us. Uh, perhaps you have a staff member, friend, colleague who would also benefit from these sessions.
All right. And one last uh, reminder or announcements is we have a webinar series coming up called Living in Long-Term Care Today. It is really for um, anyone involved in long-term care, including residents, family members, and professional caregivers. And it's going to have topics including maintaining engagement, um, uh, an infection prevention focus session on boosting health and safety for loved ones, um, honoring and understanding late life, and then a COVID-19 uh, update. So we invite you to join us for those sessions. They're going to start May 16th, and they'll be Tuesdays for a month from 1 to 2 p.m. Mountain. And here are some additional resources that you can use to uh, further explore some of the concepts uh, and ideas that we talked about today. Right. Thank you all for joining us and uh, we invite you to stay on for additional discussion. All right, so at this point, we'll um, open up uh, the echo for your additional uh, thoughts, questions, maybe it's observations from your work or things that you'd like uh, help with or to talk about the group with. Um, Catherine, this is Renee. Um, I'm just curious if the huddle, the suggestion that was made is is thinking, uh, you know, really about um, uh, nurses at change of shift around the nurses station, or are we thinking even broader than that? Because when I think about long-term care, the people who are working in maintenance or the people who are working in dining. I mean, you know, there are other people who are uh, that probably need this huddle idea as well. Maybe Kathy, you're the, the person to talk about this. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe Je Jen or Kathy, take that. Well, absolutely. I think the original concept was um, between the shift huddles, um, but you you raise an excellent point again, Renee, that this really has application across all roles. And it's uh, stress in our, in our setting is like stress. Everyone feels some level of stress potentially. And there's, you know, we've, we're having challenges with staffing shortages in a number of roles, not just in the nursing roles. So I, I think you, uh, you raise a good point. So you, I personally like to try to pair new activity with something that's already going because sometimes you get a little bit it's a little easier to start something new that way. So many of us have shift to shift huddles. So that can be a place to add on for the clinical staff, but the morning administrator meeting or even the morning clinical meeting could be a location to get to go across departments and uh, find a, uh, a moment to talk about uh, stressors, how things are going, or have people like we do with pain, even right, what's what's happening today with either the stress or the joy that you're having, and share that. So that, those are, it's an excellent question. With these team huddles, we actually did them at the hospital that I worked at. We did have a lot of staff conflict, just personal conflict, and mm -hmm. some thinking they were doing better care than the others, and um, so when we started doing these group or team huddles real quick before and letting them know what's going on, you know, like um, one staff member was having some trouble at home with her daughter. And um, so she was just her, that's where her mind was at the time. And just letting the other staff members know that, you know, I'm, if I get short with you today, I really, I don't mean it personally to you but this is what I have going on and just something real quick like that. And it, it helped um, with a lot of the conflict we had with our staff members. I like that, Jennifer. I, I also just wanted to add that I used to model this when I was an administrator, I would model this by having my department head meeting and people would not necessarily share whatever their personal challenges were, but it was a good time for people to be able to say, you know, my department is down two people so that you understood when you're asking someone from, uh, you know, environmental services to come help you with something, what their challenges are. And, you know, my my encouragement was let this trickle down, like take this back to your department and, and I'm modeling it. Now you guys go do the same thing. 
And uh, that was really the challenge, uh, though. I didn't find it trickling down very well. So just a challenge, that's all. Renee, that's a really good point as well, is uh, the forms we discussed, the shift to shift huddles usually include the nursing staff and hopefully the CNA teams as well. Um, but we don't always have readily available forms outside of our staff meeting that would get the other members of departments. Usually it's the lead for the department. So it's a, it's a really good point. And there will be times when things come up and that's um, the leader may need to help redirect some of the conversation or identify people that might need additional resources to help manage through their stressors. We had a comment in the chat box around um, time management of huddles that it's really easy for them to run too long. Does mm -hmm. anyone have any strategies to to address that? Well, some sometimes you can uh, you can set some nice some soft alarms and say you know we'll take we'll take a few minutes to have this discussion and set the expectation before the discussion starts so that people understand there, there unfortunately needs to be a time limit to it. And then you, if there's more that needs to be discussed that you can't get to, then that would be an indicator. Maybe we need some special time set aside for this. Um, that's a great question. I think huddles are really valuable. Um, seeing the manager every day. And like you say, kind of reviewing, this is happening in the hospital, be aware of it, or going over case studies. And when people have really difficult um, clients or patients that they're dealing with to, you know, assign people to be back up or, I mean, they can be just so valuable and you get to be heard a little bit even just the scheduling at work. I, I, I just thought they were really good. I felt real supported. That's great. Thank you, Mary. And, and Crystal Morse is asking, are breaks and lunches discussed in team huddles since those breaks are so important for de-stressing? That is also a great question, Crystal. And um, that would be something to work with the team on. What would be the topics that would be covered in a, in a staff huddle, uh, in the team huddles? Uh, there's lots of different ways to craft these huddles and different applications. Uh, so, and, and also different agendas. So they, they can serve a lot of different purposes. I love the whole huddle concept. Sometimes we do huddles after a fall and everyone comes together to look at that fall so we can uh, start a very prompt investigation as to what occurred. That's an example of a huddle, a shift to shift huddle. That would be a great place to talk about who's going on break when so that we can help cross cover each other. Um, but breaks are really important to de-stress. You're absolutely right. And um, having, some discussion before you have the huddles as to what they're going to cover uh, will even make them more effective. I, I was going to mention here, uh, Don Jurovich, that uh, in clinic operations, sometimes our nurse manager um, will do some uh, room cleanup uh, or help with some of the tasks to um, sort of reduce the work burden of the other staff. Um, so that's important. The other question I had, maybe Natasha or Jennifer could answer this is, what, what is the best methodology in long-term care for notifying staff, uh, ranging from CNAs, nursing to you know, uh, maintenance and so forth uh, about the PDSA cycles? Well, I know Natasha had to step away, but... Um... PDSA cycles can be do can be done anywhere. Really, it's you have your plan, and um, and then you study it or just put it into action. And so your plan for this, for example, for the the um, sorry the huddles is if something comes up right away, you know you've already had if you put this plan into place for your quick group or team huddles, just call your staff on your if you have radios or something like that, or if you just see them and say, 
can we just get together real quick and do a quick discussion? This is what we've got going on, like right before lunch, um, talking about those breaks and stuff, you know, before we go to lunch today, we've still got this, this, and this left to do. Can any of you help me out with that? Um, and so everyone can have a break today. I don't know if that's really asking, answering your question, but um, just having that process in place and trying it out. And if it works, that it can free up a lot of time and everyone can have their breaks. Jennifer, I like your examples. They're really helpful. Uh, another um, thought Kevin actually put into chat, has anyone uh, in the meeting done a PDSA around huddles themselves? I think that's a great idea, uh, really would be helpful. Another way to help communicate initiatives like PDSAs um, is to uh, create boards, like storyboards, and maybe in the break room on, on uh, what you're working on that is being where the PDSA concepts being applied so that everyone can see what it's about and understand how it, the different steps work. And also it's a great way to show outcomes. How are you doing with that particular PDSA initiative and is it helpful or not? So that's a, um, some examples. We would I, also, go ahead. <laughs> oh no, you go ahead, Jen. And I was gonna see if Tara had a microphone to share more about this idea of behavior huddles. Oh, I was just going to say we had, when we started doing huddles for um, patient care in the hospital, we would have the charge nurse kind of go through the list of patients that we had. We had um, infection control involved. We had physical therapy involved, even if we could get the provider there in a hospital setting anyway, involved and just say, okay, this patient has an x-ray at this time. This is when they plan on coming up. So then even aides and stuff would know, okay, I'm gonna to have to have them up and out of bed by this time. And just going through things like that made the whole, the whole shift go so much smoother because everyone in each department knew what they needed to do or if um, they were getting a, a medication around that time that they knew they needed to pass that medication a little bit before. And it just, everything laid out so much better throughout that shift. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up a little more on Tara's comment about having behavior huddles. Uh, Tara, I think that is like a fabulous idea. There's a few things I like about that. Just like with fall huddles, the quicker you can get the, the folks that were involved or witnesses, the, the quicker you can start the investigation and then you um, have a better chance of being able to identify the most appropriate root cause triggers, et cetera. But the other piece of what you said here, Tara, that strikes me is using the huddle as an opportunity for the staff to talk about their feelings about what just occurred with that event when there's a behavioral outburst with the resident. Um, just like with Allison dealing with the grieving of, of one of her favorite residents who's actively dying, um, having a behavioral outburst from a resident can really can be traumatic for the staff. And I love that you all incorporated going through that feeling piece of it. I think that that is like a real gift to your staff and, and will help them uh, develop some additional tools to manage in the future. And Tara has said that uh, after significant behavior, they gather, discuss precipitating factors, escalating and de-escalating factors, and then be able to adjust the care plan and decompress. So I, I love that. I think you guys have used that huddle concept uh, exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, it's really excellent for identifying those antecedents or what's happening before mm -hmm. a behavior. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to retrace those steps after the fact. It's really excellent. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Other questions? I'm really excited to see what uh, you guys uh, learn over the next month with doing PDSA on huddles. I think that's going to be really informative. It's one of our best tools and, and used sometimes consistently and lots of times inconsistently. So it'll be uh, really fun to hear the outcome. Thank you for being so engaged in the topic.
I, I want to shift the conversation just a little bit. At the beginning um, of the session and in Dr. McLean's talk, he discussed um, burnout and you know this really um, clearly different situation of burnout versus you know our, our stressors that we face every day. Um, interested to to see if if you all have experienced burnout. Um, maybe not personally, but with staff, um, in a way that affects what, how they're able to perform, uh, at work and, and how you address that. Is there a system? Is there a way that you have found that is helpful to people in that situation? I'm trying to find the mute button. Um, it was kind of interesting in the beginning when you were talking about the microburst and you used part of the definition of burnout as chronic workplace stress. And I just went, oh yeah, that's why I quit. <laughs> like I didn't even maybe realize I was so burned out, but it is difficult. And I, I it would be really interesting to hear some of the solutions. I can, I mean, in, in my position, the changes were going to be too drastic and retirement looked too sweet. And I was close enough to retirement. So I did that, but it's, I don't know. I, I, I felt like I had no way to work around it. So it's, it's a really huge subject and we all know people who are burning out and have been burnt out. Right. right. Gosh, thank you, Mary, for, for um, sharing that. And I'm curious, was that before, during, or after COVID that you decided to leave? You know, COVID didn't have anything to do with it as, as much as uh, the person I was job sharing with. That just became really difficult. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I see Lori's comment um, that they have significant burnout right now. Uh, another COVID outbreak, staff leaving, staff issues, negative attitudes. We could use some suggestions. Absolutely. Um, Catherine, I, I I can relate to what Mary Lee was saying because I I definitely when I look back I didn't realize it at the time, but it, but when I look back I can tell you when I started taking my personal effects home just a couple of handfuls at a time out of my office when I would leave I was sort of slowly moving out of my office so if something like that were to happen and I said I had enough I would be ready right that's such a red flag. And so in, in what um, Lori is saying here in the chat as well, uh, I don't know that I have anything helpful other than to say, I wonder what someone could have said to me, what could have been done at that moment or over the course of those weeks to change the course of what happened. And I really feel like had my supervisor slowed down, stopped and just said, um, what can I do to help? What's overwhelming you? Think about how you're feeling and tell me and, you know, how, how can I, what can I do? I, I really feel like just feeling heard and making me slow down and stop and think about it myself. What is wrong? Because I, I wasn't even doing that. I was so, you know, worked up. I don't know if that helps, but I'm, it's a suggestion. Yeah, Renee, I think that's, that's good too. If you have that free time, what can I do to help? And I was, I'm very guilty of thinking I need to do everything on my own because that's my job and, and not asking for that help. So if someone has that time, you don't have a whole lot of time in, in nursing for sure. And just, if you have just a few minutes, you know, I've got a few minutes right now, what can I do? And just those few minutes of doing something for someone can help them out so much during that shift. Gosh, what, um, Renee, your, your idea and, and kind of your own little mini looking back <laughs> partial PDSA cycle, um, and what you're saying generally fit with what is actually in this HHS resource, um, that I would encourage all of you to look at if you're experiencing this, it, um, has some information on exactly that. How do we touch base? How do we empathize with, with our, um, employees who are suffering in, in their work. I'm going to loop back to the chat box. Here's some, uh, ideas, 
small frequent things uh, such as gift cards for picking up after extra shifts, handwritten notes, potlucks, taking an interest in your staff can all help prevent burnout. Thank you, Connie. Um, Samantha says that they're trying to encourage those with burnout to try and take some time off and completely disconnect from work. This is hard due to being short staffed, but along with uh, that, also encouraging everyone to ask for help when they need it, because we would much rather uh, help you than have you quit. Very, very well said, uh, Samantha. Thank you. And then Jessica says, ensuring everyone gets breaks, lunch breaks, 15 minute breaks and, and days off finding opportunities staff to remove them from work and themselves from work in uninterrupted. Um, Jenny shared some of the um, information from Dr. McLean's microburst. Uh, again, with looking at uh, things that you can and can't control and your individual kind of attitudes towards work. Um, and then Crystal has shared a white paper in the chat as well. These are great ideas, excellent suggestions and resources that I think will demonstrate engagement. That's the other piece is for me, I, I uh, share some of the stories everyone's sharing about their own experiences and having engagement from leadership uh, and that what we're experiencing as a team member, if, that that's important, knowing it's important uh, goes a long way. Uh, another, uh, Sometimes when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I like to have like a prescribed kind of approach as well. And I, it might be helpful to have an initiative in, in a community on what are the things that we're doing to reduce stress and burnout. And some of the, the recommendations right here, in addition to huddles, I think are extremely helpful. Another thing I found helpful at times is something called um, rounding for engagement. And it's, uh, I don't know if you've had any, any exposure to the Studer work, S-T-U-D-O-R. It's a leadership group. Um, they've uh, made a recommendation for leaders to walk through a process to show engagement and to start engaging employees as well. And, and you go around and you ask, you make sure that you're making walking rounds, that you also ask people what's going well today what's not going well, do you have the resources you need to be able to do the work you do? Because that not having resources and supplies or not having them at your fingertips can be a real source of stress and then burnout. And then the, um, the fourth element I think is also really important and that's asking who can I give a compliment to today? Who on your team do you feel like would um, has been doing a great job and I'd like to be able to acknowledge them and and uh, do a shout out for them. So those are those are some other ideas that might help you. But having like a little task list that you can sort of follow in your mind uh, to help you stay on task with really promoting engagement and really learning what what is working and what's not working uh, in the uh, actual care delivery. Thank you, Kathy. That's a very very cool idea. Um, Emily says, uh, I love written notes of gratitude, powerful way to acknowledge someone and also gives them an opportunity to read the messages again on another day if they're feeling down. It's a beautiful idea. How I'm, I'm curious, we have about seven more minutes left, how you identify people who might be burning out, like what ways can you tell and, and how does that then trigger you to, to do something? The first thing that jumps to my mind is decreased performance, coming in late, leaving early, not just, just decreased performance from a once high performer. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Are there warning signs or things that come to mind? Bonnie says increased complaining and, and lack of cooperation with others, right? You know, Catherine, one of the other areas that this is, 
this is a little bit of a conundrum in our space in post-acute long-term care uh, because there's such a heightened sensitivity to uh, making sure that we have no abuse or neglect. And that's absolutely the right thing to do, but uh, it can be really hard on staff. And, and the other piece that will happen is staff may develop more irritability they may not have as much patience when they're actually suffering from stress and burnout. And that can lead to a whole nother issue around, is there, an, is there abuse? And then, then it triggers all the investigation and the education and interventions that occur so that we can show that we're really creating a climate that doesn't tolerate abuse when it all sort of stemmed from someone getting more irritable and maybe not giving a resident as much time to get something done and the resident felt like they were being rushed or treated roughly. And so I think that's one of the places this, the rubber really meets the road and, uh, and being sensitive to that before it gets to that level. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's an excellent point on the complexities of this and that, uh, you know, probably speaks to why this is so important, not only for that individual's well-being, but for the um, safety and, and well-being of your residents. Absolutely. Brianna says she's randomly uh, going around handing out gift cards and appreciation cards to employees at least once a week. Oh, that is frequent. Um, and Jen, someone who's normally talkative and then won't talk unless asked a question. Yeah, great sign. Absolutely. Okay, any other um, thoughts, reflections about today's session and maybe something that you will implement this week or this month? We have a month before we meet again. I know for myself, I'm not in long-term care, but I have a team I work with is probably outwardly showing more, more gratitude and appreciation um, in ways that are, are meaningful to them. I know next month we'll be sharing some fun stuff that one of our North Dakota nursing homes does for their team. So excited for that. Oh, that's perfect, Jen. I think we have um, a really wonderful extension of this conversation next month on May 24th. Samantha will have their hospital appreciation barbecue. Uh, they have a whole week honoring employees. It's wonderful. Um, Dr. Jervich liking the appreciation gestures. Yeah, I agree. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Very glad that this was useful. Uh, Catherine and Lori, thanks for coming. And next month, I think, proves to continue to be very useful. And we'll have that uh, kickoff or that next meeting on May 24th. And then the webinar series will begin on May 16th. So we will make sure that all of you get uh, your invitations and information on that. Uh, for the webinar series, we ask that you help us promote that. It should be uh, really useful to your residents, their family members, and your staff as well. Great. Any closing thoughts from anyone? I just want to thank everyone who participated both verbally and in chat. It's uh, it's really been great to be able to interact with you guys and to hear your stories. So thank you. And get your tips, all your wisdom. Yes, yes so many wonderful ideas. And Kathy, thank you. Uh, you bring so much experience and, and wisdom to this group. It's a pleasure to have you. Great.
Well, thank you to our wonderful QIO collaborators. Uh, we appreciate you and we'll see everyone back um, in a month. It'll go really fast. That's all I know about that month.